The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. India's failure to build wind and solar fast enough and the U.S.'s failure to do anything about existing transportation emissions, I identify those two things now as the problem children, the problem twins of, of getting emissions to go down. Solve those two things, we'll get emissions going down sooner. Don't solve them, we're going to have to wait for emissions to go down later. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. It's a special treat to have such a story journalist and author on the show. I think you, my listeners, are really going to enjoy today's episode. My guest today is Gregor McDonald. He is the author of Oil Fall, How Wind and Solar Will Jailbreak the Power Grid. And he is best known for his newsletter, The Gregor Letter. Welcome to the show, Gregor McDonald. It's so great to be here, and I really look forward to uh, uh, our chat and also you know, any help I can give to your audience. It's not often that I have guests who are so committed to the energy transition as I am. Most of my guests are niched down, you know, CEOs of technology companies. And of course, we we cover many technologies, wind, uh, energy storage, solar, lots of solar. But, but you are somebody who has a very big picture of the energy transition, especially as it relates to transportation. So give our listeners a little background on yourself, Gregor. In the, in the pre-show, I mistakenly said that you were from Europe, or I thought you were from Europe, but you're American. Uh, what's your story, and how did you come to be so interested in the energy transition? Yeah, so you're right. Um, my angle on the energy transition is a big picture global macro uh, view. And it's also informed uh, by some you know, historical knowledge of the previous two uh, energy transitions. And I'm hap- I go micro at times, you know, I'll talk about California gasoline, but I really try to anchor myself towards that uh, global view because of course emissions are global. And, you know, that's ultimately the the thing we're trying to change. Um, Just on background, you thought I might have been European uh, because there are touches of uh, UK and British friendly uh, aspects to my newsletter. I use the word petrol. Uh, I publish on Monday mornings, uh, every other Monday morning for the 8 a.m. time in London. And that's a a habit that I formed over the years in part because London historically, from my view, has been a kind of center of energy and commodity investing. And my journey began uh, trading oil and and oil-related equities and being very focused on oil and natural gas and coal. And of course, that's not where the hot action is now. All the action is in uh, renewables, but I feel fortunate and I and I think it's helpful that I have that fossil fuel knowledge and and it, it helps you know my understanding and and hopefully my reader's understanding of energy transition, which uh, it sounds obvious to say, but yes, we're transitioning from fossil fuels to manufactured energy, to technological energy, to to infrastructure-oriented uh, energy. And uh, I'm just a big fan of economic uh, history. And, you know, the previous two uh, historical transitions are very 
very useful and helpful to my work. I'm curious if you're a uh, a fan or a critic of Vaclav Smil's work. Both. I am a longtime admirer of his scope and his productivity. He he produces a lot of very valuable historical perspectives. He has brings a lot of interesting data, and I really admire the way he's anchored by history. His weakness uh, tends to come when he makes forecasts. I think his his ability to forecast is not as not as strong as as his ability to understand history. Mm. And he's gotten himself, in my view, bogged down in the face of the current energy transition, because I don't I I don't think he understands the speed of it. I I understand his criticisms that we're not going fast enough. But remember, that's not a unique view. We all agree we're not going fast enough. So and that's his view, but he gets too over involved and that. So, well, one of the things I, I appreciate yeah. about his work is that he points out that energy transitions historically do take decades, you know, w- right. sometimes over 100 years. That's and right. I think the the cool thing that we forget sometimes is that we're 70 years into, for example, the PV revolution, right? Photovoltaics have been around since the 1950s, invented yes. in 1954 in New Jersey at Bell Labs. Yes. And and so even if the uh, the renewable energy transition, so to speak, takes a hundred years. Well, we've we're, we're seventy years into that transition, as I see it, okay. and and now, of course, we're we're going vertical. We're at the bottom of the S curve, and wind and solar are the fastest growing new sources of of grid energy globally, and that is largely because of the technology adoption curve. It's a combination though, right? It is also a function of policies because some societies are waking up to the reality of we need to incentivize the transition so that we can perhaps avoid the worst of climate change. Now, will we avoid the worst of climate change is to be to be determined because climate change is obviously, and you rightfully point this out in your newsletter, that it is kicking our butt in many ways. Um, is it a uh, is it an ex- existential threat? That's debatable, right? Uh, certainly mm-hmm. not today. It's not an existential threat. Could it be in fifty years? Yeah, it could be for yes. the good life that we have. Um, and I also love to recognize that w- we got the good life from fossil fuels. I have nothing against fossil fuels. They're amazingly dense, uh, rich resources. Uh, my own family was very involved in the fossil industry. My grandpa in Chicago uh, ran a magazine called The Black Diamond. Illinois is a coal state, and The Black Diamond was a coal industry publication. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I grew up in New Mexico where you know we have these massive Four Corners power plants, which cause major pollution, including pumping mercury into the environment. My father wrote a book on mercury, the social... Uh, negative impacts of mercury mm. poisoning. And uh, so I grew up learning about these things. It wasn't until 2016 that I got into uh, solar uh, real, you know, for for, for real, uh, working in the solar PV industry. So anyway, you write a lot about tipping points. And while we're still at a relatively small percentage, for example, of EV adoption in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think that these small numbers can be a bellwether for the coming tipping point? Talk a little bit about that and how you see the electrification of transportation globally and in the United States. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that. There, There's other tipping points that I'm interested in as well. Much of my work the past five years and 10 years has been very anticipatory about what could potentially happen with wind and solar, what could potentially happen with electric vehicles. I like to speculate uh, in advance of these things happening. In some sense, the first chapter of my work on renewables over the last 10 years, in some sense, is over now because the S-curve, as you say, is, is rising. And we might even use a Charles Dickens uh, title it's a it, we're in a tale of two cities so we it's we must be sober and be legitimately concerned about how the effects of climate change are already landing 
we should be really encouraged by how fast uh, the leading edge technologies are going. So your question was about uh, transportation and electric vehicles. Okay, I'll try to make this complicated subject as simple as possible. In any domain, the transition to electric vehicles is initially felt as a slow, a very slight slowing of the rate of growth of oil demand. So you're still going to have oil demand growing or holding on to a plateau. You're not into a decline yet. Um, but what I've started to notice is that once you get to the six, seven, eight year out, where after internal combustion engine vehicle sales have peaked and you've got about six to seven, eight years of EV adoption, what I think we're starting to notice now, and California is a perfect example of this, is that after being on a, a, an oscillating 20 year plateau, California gasoline demand has actually started to fall. And you're seeing that again, we're seven to eight years past peak ice sales in California. We've got wonderful S curve of EV adoption in California. We're heading towards 25, 30% of, of plug-in sales this year in California. And finally, after all that time, you're starting to see the beginnings of a gentle decline in gasoline. That will get more accelerated uh, but it will be it will be somewhat slow for a time. On a global basis, we're not there yet. On a global basis, we're 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 not at the point where global oil demand can actually enter decline mm -hmm. because of what's happening in transportation. But we are, in my view, at the point where global oil demand will stop growing. And let me just add a definition to that because these discussions of peaks and declines and so forth, I wanna, I wanna tie myself down to that. It's my current view that 2019 began a oscillating plateau period of global oil demand. And by that, I mean, demand will fluctuate between one and one and a half percent above the 2019 level and we might that might happen this year for example and it will decline one and a half percent below that level and it will do this for a while until the global auto fleet gets seven to eight years past peak ice until the global auto fleet mm -hmm. you know gets those higher EV um EV yeah. things so when I say tale of two cities it's so encouraging everything that we're doing we're not yet at the point of fossil fuel declines, okay? We're, we're reaching the point where they're no longer gonna grow, but then there's gonna be this gray area where they don't decline yet. They will decline, but not yet. And when you go to, or when you look at Northern Europe, right, EV sales are much further along. Uh, more Absolutely. than more than 50% of new car sales and upwards of 80 90% in some countries like Norway i think uh, plug-ins account for 90 plus percent now norway has strongly incentivized the adoption of, of evs it's very ironic my family is half norwegian and uh, my kids are bicultural norwegian american and you know the economy in norway is dependent on oil right north sea oil and gas make norway sure. wealthy and yeah. they have no plans to stop burn, baby, burn, but they also are environmentally f sensitive uh, and their their grid is very clean already on hydro. They have lots of native hydropower. And and so they are they do have a clean grid and now they have accelerated and leaned into electrification of transportation. But and I and I like to say, you know, if you want to see the future when it comes to electrification and clean energy, go to Northern Europe. What what do you see in Northern Europe? Yeah. So I'm glad you asked that. So it's really important for Americans to understand, especially, because I think it's obvious if you're sitting outside the United States, that as we sit here today, America, Europe uses two policies to reduce oil demand. The adoption of electric vehicles alongside the build out of renewable electricity. So that's shifting demand for petrol 
over to um, uh, electricity. And there I am using my petrol word because we're we're in Europe now. But Europe has also been steadily reducing oil demand in the EU for over a decade. And that's through efficiency policies and taxation policies, congestion pricing, and disincentives on ICE vehicles. America doesn't do that. America, in fact, I gave a corporate presentation to a, a, a corporate board uh, several months ago, and I, I explored a lot of these you know, differences, and I, I worked up a case of how America does energy transition. America does energy transition with its technology forward, its adoption forward, it's we're going to do all these new things, but we're not going to penalize current automobile owners who drive ICE cars. We're not going to do congestion charges. We're not going to do disincentives around oil, except on a state-by-state -state basis, like California. California. And unfortunately, Tim, what that means is that there's this very attractive presentation that surrounds our policy here in the United States. It's very exciting. We're going to subsidize electric vehicles and electric vehicle sales are going up. But because we're not doing anything about existing, the existing ICE fleet, it means we're waiting for that fleet to turn over. And in my view, that means the U.S. could have greater reductions in emissions this decade. Without any change, we're pushing the the harvesting of those emissions decade uh, of those uh, emissions into next decade. So there's a real difference between how Europe does it and how and how we do it. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, if you want to drive a car into a major city in Europe, there is a toll ring around that city and you pay upwards of ten dollars or more to of course. to take a vehicle into the city. And I mean, it is, a, and it's it works, totally right? You you think twice about driving a car and they have good train systems so that you have options, trains and buses. It's a both mm -hmm. hand. Um, we have neither <laughs> many times. Mm -hmm. um, or the... Tim, uh, Tim, our most transit-oriented, uh, built-out city in America, the New York City and the New York metropolitan region, they're having political problems putting in a congestion charge, not in all of New York City, not in the other boroughs, not even in the top two thirds of Manhattan, just the bottom third of, of Manhattan. Mm. And that really show. and remember this is Democrat, you know, I'm a Democrat, it's democratically controlled. And this is something I've been talking about in recent issues. We've got a lot of democratically controlled cities and municipalities You've got Democrat governors, Democratic mayors, Democratic uh, state senators, and we and even then, we can't do a congestion charge in New York City. You had the Democratic mayor, Democratic senators, Democratic congressmen, all from New Jersey, complaining bitterly about a congestion charge going into Lower Manhattan. I mean, come on, you know. Yeah. So that really is a measure of where we are culturally. Just one more thing on that. I live in Portland, Oregon, right? We're like we're like the poster child for, you know, progressivism. We we we're totally bogged down here. We're a great cycling city. We just can't do anything about the cars. Hmm. It's incredible. How did you get interested in uh the energy transition anyway? I was living in London and the price of oil hit an all-time low and it created a couple of those famous uh, covers of The Economist magazine, which, you know, if, if you're in the field, it's somewhat it's somewhat well known. And I, I was teaching uh, uh, creative writing because that's part of my background. I'm a, you know, a journalist now, but I was teaching creative writing to uh, kids in London. And I was looking for other things to investigate. And I realized that I didn't know anything about energy, didn't know anything about oil. And I just decided to use that time to educate myself for the simple reason that I thought, wow, oil prices at like, you know, $10, 11 12 or whatever it was, a barrel, that just seemed so cheap to me. So that, that started me on my journey of learning about fossil fuels, trading in, in equity 
and futures markets trading trading oil. And I I you know I got very wrapped up in that oil bull market from 2002 uh, to 2008, where of course oil helped break it helped break the world uh, into its financial crisis. Obviously, that crisis had its had its main uh, antecedents, its sources in the financial system itself, in mortgages and leverage and so forth. But I do think it's fair to say that $150 oil in the summer of 2008 was was a pretty good catalyst to break the consumer and and break things. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's how I got that's how I got started. And then I I just began you know writing uh, about energy markets because I had friends who worked in financial markets. They liked what I had to say. So. I think 08 was the year that Tesla really got going. Um, Sounds about right. And now yeah. they they control, you know, upwards of what, 85, 90% of the EV market. It is amazing how Elon has, has cornered that market in the United States. There's other players and substantial companies, but uh, they don't have uh, uh, really much market share in the U.S. Um, and, they, and they also didn't get the head start that he, you know, that Elon mm-hmm. got, you know, one thing I write about in my newsletter is that the existing legacy automakers, I know that they must have known this, but when they, whenever it was, they decided that they were interested in making electric vehicles, they needed to understand that uh, in the history of the internal combustion engine vehicle, you simply provided a, a gas tank, a petrol tank on board the vehicle and your responsibility to figure out how to power the car that was over. The EV drivetrain completely shifts the burden of who's providing uh, the power in the car. It shifts it from an empty, simple petrol tank to, as you know, a, a sturdier chassis and a big battery pack. And I, you know, I think the the existing automakers didn't panic soon enough. Uh, I would say that VW panicked almost at the right time. You know, a couple of years ago, they realized they needed to lock up battery capacity. They needed to lock up lithium. I, I think they went to a, a battery maker. Uh, is it Northgate or it's Northlink? I may not have the right word, but they basically, VW went in and said, we'll buy all your future production and we'll double your market capitalization with a whole boat, boat, you know, boatload of money so that you can make even more battery production. And we'll take that too. And, you know, that's been okay for VW, but it would have been good if, if VW had done that, you know, even five years before, by the way, that's North Volt. Yes. Is, um, yeah. And the- very interestingly now here in 2023, the Tesla model Y became the number one, car sale uh number one car in sales year to date um displacing the toyota corolla so when you look globally at car sales toyota has fallen from number one and tesla is now king i predicted this uh when i owned a tesla model y a few years ago i no longer do unfortunately that's another story for another day but I could see that this car was going to be immensely popular. I didn't know that it, they would achieve this uh, in 2023 on a global basis. And it's quite amazing because a Tesla Model Y is almost twice as expensive as a Toyota Corolla. Mm-hmm. And yet it's it's seeing uh, this wide adoption uh, because of its utility and the lifetime cost. Let's break this down, though, a little bit like. What is driving the transition to EVs? I think of two things. There's the operating costs. You know, one, you're, you're running a car on electricity, not mm-hmm. on gasoline. Mm-hmm. And, then there's, and then there's things like, well, an EV has many, many fewer moving parts. And so the lifetime costs of maintaining and operating that machine are just going to be lower right, than an ICE engine vehicle. And eventually, you know, sometime in the next five to 10 years, the ICE engine goes bye-bye completely, right, purely because of economics and consumers will go where it pays, right? It will just get tougher and tougher to support the ICE platform as it as its market share, you know, continues to shrink. If I recall correctly, ICE vehicle sales peaked globally, 
uh, I think 2000, either 2016 or seven or 17. And then just on, just to follow up on your remarks on Tesla, we're so fortunate in the United States to have Tesla because without Tesla, we'd be almost nowhere. And I mean, we're still the laggard in EV adoption, uh, way behind China and Europe, although we're we're starting to catch up. But I mean, without Tesla, we would have years and years ahead before we could catch up unless we were willing to allow foreign automakers to really flood our market um, with, with their products. So Americans have pretty much had Tesla as an option and maybe something else if you could get it and we're still you know, somewhat there. I think the Volkswagen ID4 is going, going well. The Chevrolet Bolt uh, is going well. Of course, it doesn't help when General Motors says, here's the Bolt. Oh, no, we're going to take away the Bolt. Okay, we, we, sorry, we made that mistake. Now we'll put it back on again. That, that's not the kind of thing that creates consumer confidence in, in that particular model. So that hasn't been, you know, so helpful. Yeah. Our, legacy automakers. And there was a period when I watched a lot of uh, videos comparing the Model Y to the, you know, Mach-E, the Ford Mach-E and the ID4, right? Those three cars are, are competitors and they, they're shoulder to shoulder in, t in terms of performance and, you know, uh, overall experience for the consumer. But it's night and day, right? How consumers are reacting to those products and, and buying them. Um, yeah, th this this difficult this challenge of a legacy producer of something to try to make a new product. I, I believe work was done around this by Clayton Christensen at MIT, maybe in the fifties or sixties, and he he talked about the the cultural challenge within an incumbent, right inside that corporate culture of an incumbent, to try to imagine what a different customer would want and how they would make a product for that new customer. I think he almost talks about it in, in terms of um, like a sympathetic, you know, a sympathetic view of the ability to adopt what they want. Musk has never had, he doesn't have to deal with that. He doesn't have to deal with trying to shepherd along and baby an ex a previous existing line of technology. He also doesn't have the pension plans. And so it's clearly been very difficult for the legacy automakers mm -hmm. uh, to handle this. I thought Ford's move to electrify the 150, at one point I thought, okay, they're they've that's pretty good actually. Instead of trying to do all electrics, they just go with their top selling vehicle, which is the top selling vehicle in the United States for what, the last 20 years, the F-150, they're gonna electrify that good strategic decision but oops no battery capacity you know it's ford didn't do anything to make sure that they would be able to stamp out that drivetrain and they don't have the capacity that tesla does or even you know vw has so well, yeah i had i uh, i had a ford uh, 150 reservation for over two and a half years before mm -hmm before they sent me the signal that I could buy. Mm -hmm. And then I was no longer in the market, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I love the, the V to G aspects of that vehicle. Yes. Um, I also can't justify driving such a heavy vehicle. But, but anyway, uh, you make a very good point. Like, they don't have the capacity. They can't make enough trucks. People no. would buy them gladly, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Cannot make them. And uh, Elon, meanwhile, has been busy building gigafactories, right? <laughs> and yeah. just announced another one in Mexico, right? Just on our doorstep. Um, man. Well, let's talk. And when, and when he builds a gigafactory, he's he's duplicating, right? You know, that's the that's the uh, one way to talk about, you know, the history of uh, planet Earth and evolution is making copies. Once you have found the thing that you're going to make, once you've optimized the thing you're going to make, you just have to make copies. And he got the head start before everyone else. So, yeah. yeah. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well 
With CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. Let's talk about the economy at um, the larger picture, right? We have approximately 40 gigatons of carbon pollution that we're trying to uh, clean out of the economy to have a green economy between now and 2050. Uh, various states and now the federal government are getting serious about this. And actually, 40 gigatons is, in the greater scheme of things, relative child's play. Because we have a trillion tons or a thousand gigatons of pollution in the atmosphere that's causing runaway climate change. Mm-hmm. We, need to, we need to get rid of those 40 gigatons. And then we need to get serious about the thousand gigatons that are up there because CO2 in the atmosphere, the PPMs have been going up about a percent a year, right? We're at 420. Yeah. We need to get yeah. sub 300. And that's another thing that some energy professionals, myself included, forget to shine a light on sometimes. Like, it's great to think about those 40 gigatons. And I make my living working in solar wind and storage. And I have no, no plans to go elsewhere, right? That's a very important job to decarbonize the economy and it clean is. the grid. It is. But, but what is your perspective about how humanity is tackling this problem per se? I mean, the, the energy transition is going to happen. It's a question of how fast it's going to happen. Um, and then there's industry, heavy industry, right? Decarbonizing heavy industry. We have the technology. I've had some of these companies on the show, like Rondo Energy. You could make green steel with electricity, or hydrogen. The Swedes are doing it with hydrogen, I think. Okay. And so we can truly do all the things that we do with fossil fuels, with other technologies that we can fuel with clean electrons from the sun. But okay. what's your perspective on decarbonizing the economy? Thank you. And then that bigger thank you for ask- yeah, problem. Thank you for asking this because I, this has been a, a big focus of mine this year. And what I'd like to do is, try to answer your question in three parts that I think would be most helpful to your to your audience. Wonderful. First, I want to I want to use a more uh, constrictive case, and that's just the case of global electricity, just the case of of global power. So this doesn't include transportation and cement making and steel making. This is just the decarbonization of electricity. My current I mean, if I say model, it, it, I, I'm probably overestimating my sophistication. I'll say model. My current model shows that if the growth of wind and solar continues its manic pace, and I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, every one of us who've been following the sector for a decade, even we're blown away by the by the ability of global wind and solar to keep tacking on huge amounts of new capacity on an annual basis. So my model says, if we continue to do that over the next six and a half years to the year 2030, and you plot that against what would be a reasonable compound growth for system demand, right? For system demand, there's a really good chance that emissions, total emissions from global power will begin to fall by 2030. Now, I just want to clarify something about that. We're already moving into the phase where global emissions just from power are starting to level out, right? So this isn't really, I'm going to focus more on the decline. So electricity is where we're making our greatest fastest, most broad and concerted uh, progress. Consider that, however, how hard it's going to be to get to declines, even if we continue going bananas on creating wind and solar, and you just project a relatively normal to slightly stepped up growth rate in total system demand. Okay. That's a really good case for how everyone can frame up this problem, right? Frame up the problem of how do we get to emissions declines, 
right? That's what I'm really focused on now. I'm not as focused on getting to an emissions plateau. I think we're, Tim, I think we're headed there. We're, we're, we're Whether it's even global electricity, and now we can expand it to everything global, we are heading right into peak emissions globally. And that's very encouraging. What's sobering is what it will mean to get to declines. Now, let's go to the third piece, the economy. I've written a lot about this, and you may recall I devote a whole section of this in my ebook, Oil Fall. I devote a section to the really spectacular prize that awaits us. And that prize is running the same economy with the same services and the same demand on less energy. Because as we know, renewable energy and clean energy doesn't involve combustion. And every time you involve combustion, whether it's in an individual engine, you know, driving down Interstate 5 from LA to San Diego, or whether it's in a massive coal plant, you know, in Wyoming, the heat losses, which is just another way of saying energy losses, is ca are catastrophic. I mean, you drive from LA to San Diego, you fill up your car, and what's that going to cost now? About 80 bucks, right? So, you, you know, you drive, for every dollar you put in your car to drive to San Diego, at least 50 cents of it just blows out the tailpipe. You, you didn't use, you didn't get to use that energy. You didn't get to capture it. It's wasted energy. And that's our emissions problem. So we should not fear. I used to fear. I used to fear that energy transition would mean a big step down in global growth, in human, you know, it might cause an interruption in human progress for a while because it would be so disruptive. I, I, that was 15 years ago, I thought that when I didn't know as much as I know now. The prize that awaits us is that we can have the world that we have today using less energy. We'll get there with electricity first, then we'll get there with transportation, and then there will be those hard to abate sectors like steel and cement where things get tricky and complicated. And let's remember to conduct energy transition is a global infrastructure project. And when you're building infrastructure, you need cement and steel and lots of it. So that's going to be the tougher thing. But I'm very encouraged that we're going as fast as we are. And I'm not concerned at all about the economy. I'm in the boom, the energy transition economic boom camp. And I know that some people, when they hear me say that, will uh, vigorously disagree. They have Some people have very negative views about renewable energy and what it can do for us, but I, I don't think that that view is a, is a competitive view. Yeah. I mean, we're going to triple the amount of electricity we use, first and foremost, yes. when we electrify yep. transportation, right? Yep. And that's a lot of economic activity. That's a lot of building of grid of solar, wind, and batteries. And... Uh, decommissioning dirty power plants, which is good for human health. Okay, now there is a tr there is a jobs transition here, right? We have to be sensitive to transitioning workers. That includes miners and people that run these thermal power plants. But but states can do this. We ha we have good legislation in Illinois, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, known as CJA, that mm -hmm. has provisions to incentivize uh, power plant owners to shutter those dirty facilities and help workers transition into wind, solar, and battery. And, um, and it's happening. And but Just yeah. one small point there. You said, I think you said that your rough gauge or estimate was that we would triple electricity yeah. consumption because of the electrification of transportation I, I too see a potential tripling of electricity demand globally as we do this transition, because this transition, as your, your audience also knows, is really about the transition to electricity, right? Um, but I kind of have more like a 50 to 70% increase in, in electrical electricity demand just from that transportation 
Mm -hmm. piece. And that's because we reduce so much, you know, if you take California runs all the vehicles currently on about 15 billion gallons a day, just chop that in half in energy terms. You know, you, you electrify it all. You're, you're basically down to seven and a half billion gallons. Uh, sorry, not per day, but per year on a basis. So, but if you have more to say about that tripling, and maybe you can educate me about something. I just wanted to let you know, I use, you know, if it's X, we're going to 1.5 to 1.7 X. Yeah. Right? I think I when I say triple, I'm taking into account also uh, HVAC and industry applications. Oh, so industrial course. applications, Absolutely. transportation alone. I don't know what, what that does, but, mm -hmm. but it is, it is, uh, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm not an I, engineer. I, I don't know I exactly. That, I agree on that tripling though. Yeah. Once we get everything over. And I mean, the, the good news is, is there's plenty of, of wind and solar to go around. We get five to 10,000 times more energy from the sun than all of society uses on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. five to 10 because it, I mean, at today's levels, it's 10, but because we're going to use more electricity, I say five, um, 5,000. So anyway, we're swimming in energy from the sun. We and are. now we have the technology in the form of solar photovoltaics, solar PV, and wind, and now storage technologies, including batteries, but also hot sand, hot bricks, and various and sundry other concentrated technologies, right? We have the technology, as Jigger Shaw loves to say. And I wanted to, yeah. to reverberate a little bit on a comment you had about, about the economic growth opportunity. This is what people call a wealth transfer opportunity to the tune of $100 trillion. It is a great economic boon for the global economy. And yes, it's, it, we're going to shrink some sectors, okay, Coal sector is dying. Coal companies are going bankrupt, right? Coal mining companies are going bankrupt because the economics of coal are no longer there. And th that's wonderful for human health. It's not great if you're a coal miner or you live in a coal state, but trust me, there are opportunities, right? <laughs> we, we see Joe Manchin in West Virginia getting behind the IRA, right? Because he knows that there is economic opportunity. And we see the battery factories getting built now in West Virginia, right? Form Energy. Form Energy. Thank from you. My home, from my home base in Massachusetts and their iron oxide yep. uh, battery. Iron and flow battery. Iron flow batteries. <clears throat> and, you know, we just speaking on economics, we have portions of this country that began to deindustrialize as far back as 70 years ago. And there are recovery and recoveries didn't come. You only have to drive through Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia and Illinois and Chicago yeah. and Detroit. Which the, I Rust it's, it's yeah, the Rust Belt, it's it's abysmal. Belt, that's right. And yet, isn't it interesting? Those property values and buildings values, you know, probably drop down in many places close to zero. I think Form Energy is going into a an older steel plant. Correct. Some West Virginia, right? And you know, it's like land values are not high in West, you know, in West Virginia. That's a fan. What a great resource we have. And when you look at the map that's forming now with all this investment from the IRA, where is it going? It's going into a lot of those states that have stagnated uh, economically uh, for, for many years. And so, yes, I refer to, uh, you said it's a energy, it's a, um, a wealth transfer event. Yep, that would be one term. The term I use is that a wealth creation event because if you look mm -hmm. at the, if you look at the, uh, the first energy transition from biomass to coal, and then you look at the second one from coal to oil, each the reason humans do energy transition is because you get a gain in biological, physical terms. It's not imaginary. It's not theoretical. When you go from wood to coal, you're stepping up 
your energy density four times. When you go from coal to oil, you're basically doing a one and a half to doubling, but you've but now you're going from a solid to a liquid, which allows you to do so many things. It's the exact same thing with wind and solar, mm. which are really just commodities now. Yeah. Wind and solar are like cheap commodities. They go up fast. And anyone who's an entrepreneur or who's in business knows. The faster you take your investment money and convert it into a machine that makes money for you, that's called return on investment. And the faster that you get return on investment, it just skews and changes all the economics in your favor. And that's happening here. It's happening in India. It's happening in China. It's happening in Northern Europe. It's wonderful. It's happening everywhere. And and yeah, so that's why solar is exploding. And, and it is going to be a wealth creation event. We'll become wealthier. And to one of your points, one of the ways we'll become wealthier is through health. We'll become wealthier through health. And yes, it is tough when a coal miner loses his job. But you can go back on YouTube and look at Bobby Kennedy campaigning in coal country, you know, in the 1960s, saying, I'm so sorry you guys lost their jobs and we got to do something for the coal miners. I mean, disruption to coal has been going on for a long time. So it's better for it's better for everybody if we take the pain, help people out always help people out when they've lost their jobs from a stranded industry, always help retra retrain them. And I want to, and I think we're doing that now and I want us to see us do more of it. Yeah. It's like we had nothing against horses, right? When we transitioned from horse and buggy to yeah. ice engine and that happened over, over just over a decade, right? There's that wonderful photo of New York city in 1901 and then in 1913, yeah. right? It's, it's yeah. all horse and buggy and then it's all ice engine 12 years later. It's amazing. And, uh, and then a whole industry in two decades just goes poof. Right. And you point this out in your newsletter as well. Um, and there's the book Clean Disruption, which I which I often refer to that that leans on this. And now we're so now we're transitioning from oil to electrons. Right. And we we happen to have a, a source of clean electrons, theoretically emission free. I mean, there are emissions involved in making solar panels and wind turbines and people, smart people, people much smarter than me have done the math on that. And yes, it is still carbon negative to do this. Right. right. And, and, and it does work. It is paradoxical, Gregor, that places like China and India are still building coal plants and leaning into the clean energy transition. Do you think that those countries will transition faster away from coal than the current trajectory predicts? Yeah, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because it shows that even in a command economy, right, like, like China, which yeah. is more of economy by committee and so forth, even there, they have the legacy approaches like coal-fired power generation, constituencies build up around that. People have their careers in coal. They have their careers in coal plant equipment. And it's not easy politically, even for China, to simply say, we'll just dump all the, you know, we'll just dump all the coal. The, the one encouraging thing, the way I'd answer your question is, China can continue to build more coal capacity. It already has too much. So mm -hmm. go ahead, China, and build more coal capacity because, uh, you know, with the exception of years like 2022, when we had a global shortage of coal and natural gas, the capacity factor of the coal fleet is runs along at like an incredible, is it like 30 or 35% or or 40%. And, uh, you know, I talked to uh, Glenn Peters at Cicero, uh, and I think that's in Norway or Sweden or, or Denmark. I can't think of where that's located. It might be in Oslo, actually. And he, he keyed me in on this about 10 years ago. And he said, the one thing you've got to be careful about China is that, yes, they're going towards clean energy. Yes, they want to get rid of coal. They've got a cultural imperative to bring that coal down or make us up. But he said, they've got so much capacity that occasionally you'll see years when there are shortages, they'll have to rely on that extra coal capacity and it will suck basically when you get the data on that. And mm -hmm. that's what happened in 2022. We had, you know, global coal consumption peaked in 2013. We all thought it was over. 
It went gent into gentle decline for seven years. And then in 2021 and 2022, boom, it came back up again. Mm -hmm. Now that's a short lived thing, mm -hmm. but it shows you the, it, it, I like in my work, which is all about renewables. Now I do like to remind people about structural dependencies, path dependencies, the way the world was set up last century, you know, the last century is still with us. <laughs> it's still, you know, it, it's still a burden on us. And we're, you know, we're trying to trying to handle it, but it's not easy even for China and India. Well, um, Modi came to power in 2014. He had an energy minister named Payush Goyal. They did one really big, right, correct thing. They said, our country is where all the people in the world, where the most, if you try to find the most people in the world that have no elect, access to electricity, it's everywhere, but the, but the biggest chunk is here in India. Let's solve that problem. Mm. And India has done a very good job ele electrifying, but they are not doing a good job on building enough solar. They mm. need to build solar like crazy, like everyone else, and they're, and they're behind they're behind and they're India's failure to build wind and solar fast enough and the US's failure to do anything about existing transportation emissions i identify those two things now as the problem children the problem twins of of getting emissions to go down solve those two things we'll get emissions going down sooner don't solve them we're going to have to wait for emissions to go down later mm. Well, in our last few minutes together, do you have any opinions about the hydrogen economy? One of the things, one of the memes sure. or themes that I see on my show is with guests like uh, Jim Tyler from Earthos and Matt Campbell from TerraBase Energy. These are executives who are focused on bringing the cost of solar energy down to two cents a kWh or even below okay. that at which point it becomes more economical to produce green hydrogen using solar electrons, right? And, and you take water and green electrons and you get green hydrogen. Most of our hydrogen today comes from the oil industry uh, by, by taking, um, you know, like the methane molecule and breaking it up, right? Because it's carbon and hydrogen, lots of hydrogen there. But what, what are your thoughts about the green hydrogen economy? Okay, two things. One, it is a big, sprawling subject. All the myriad ways that hydrogen might be able to help us and all the myriad ways that it probably won't help us. So that's a big, big subject. I went through a fairly intense learning curve on hydrogen in 2018 and 2019 and 2020. I did a lot of work for Petroleum Economist uh, publication in London. And I, I spent almost a whole year reporting on hydrogen uh, news, you know, news stories. Um, I find that the best way to answer a question like this, Tim, is to zoom forward and think about what would things look like in its optimal state. Here's what it would kind of look like to me with hydrogen. Number one, the world starts building a lot of electrolyzers which is a big, expensive piece of capital equipment that you need to make hydrogen using electricity. It starts building a lot of those. And as a result, the price of that, those electrolyzers goes down. That's number one. That's a really, really important piece. Two, now that we've got affordable electrolyzers and we can erect them and set them up, we need to set them up in demand centers for the hydrogen that will be produced. What might what might two examples be of that? One, steel making. I've done work, um, Sweden uh, and Norway are already doing, making green steel uh, for, for Volvo cars. Not as a blanket thing, but it's a demonstration and it's done and you're displacing coal. The second place where I see a demand center is in short haul aviation, not transcontinental, not LA to Boston, sure. but but Vancouver to San Francisco, Seattle to Los Angeles. You can make hydrogen on site and feed those uh, 
engines. You can either do battery packs or you could actually do hydrogen engines. Mm -hmm. What hydrogen needs is it needs that sturdy starting place, affordable electrolyzer, demand for the hydrogen, and finding a way to make that hydrogen as green as possible, plugging in almost exclusively wind and solar or mostly exclusively wind and solar. Once we get there, which I think is the first place we're going, and another example of demand center would be petrochemicals like Louisiana and Texas. Once we get that going, I think we'll have a clearer vision on how the hydrogen applications can flower upwards from there. But I have identified what I've described to you as the best, most realistic, most plausible starting point for hydrogen production. And of course, we want to make green hydrogen. We don't want to use coal plants to make the electricity to make the hydrogen. Well, I think that's a great place to stop. Unfortunately, I am out of time. And I want to remind our listeners to check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Please give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. Those are the platforms that matter most in this regard. And tell a friend about the show. That is ultimately the best thing you can do is refer a friend to the Clean Power Hour. We're on audio platforms and on YouTube. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're dropping two videos a week, one pre-recorded interview or two sometimes. Now that we have all this RE Plus content we're working through and a live news roundup with John Weaver, my co-host and journalist for PV Magazine. Gregor McDonald, how can our listeners find you? The best place to find me is at the Gregor letter. Uh, that's on Substack. Uh, I can also be found on Twitter, although Twitter has its issues these days and it's not quite as active as, as what it was, but I am Gregor McDonald. That's M-A-C-D-O-N. ALD on Twitter. So you just type in Gregor McDonald and Google and it all comes up. And we will put links to those uh, sites in the show notes. So I want to say thank you, Gregor McDonald, for all your work and for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Tim, you were a great interviewer and I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you so much. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Take care. Let's do it. <laughs> hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about. Uh, you are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey and it would mean so much to me if you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link right there on the main navigation. That takes you to the About page, and you'll see a big graphic, Listener Survey. Just click on that graphic, and it takes just a couple of minutes. If you fill out the survey, I will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it. The other thing I want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible by corporate sponsors. We have Chin Power Systems, the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in North America. So check out CPS America. But we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work. And you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show. You know, we're dropping two episodes a week. We have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube, and we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners, and our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com, both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit, and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America. 
the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more.